Thank you for joining today's webinar. Our focus discussion today is around cognitive collaboration. It's about how artificial intelligence will drive the future of financial services. My name is Sandeep Kapoor, and I'm an educator with Digital Credence. I've been very fortunate to work and learn from many brands, brands like DCU, AEG Live, Equifax, SunTrust, Dillard's, and one lesson that I've learned from these brands is there is a fair amount of automation and an equal amount of personalization that is required to drive success. But the key here to keep in mind is that you can be more personal with humans if you have a machine that is assisting you with those mundane tasks. And keeping that in mind, we will talk about what today's thought is all about, is not about machines replacing humans, but about how machines can help humans do so much more. Keep one thing in mind, the consumer we serve today, they're really smart. They are smarter because of the technology they use. They know you have all their information. They know you track them. They simply expect you to personalize and serve them with relevance. Yes, sometimes tracking can look like it's being creepy, but in a perfect world, you would rather have someone who is tracking you to help you and your key driver is to try to convince your consumer, whether it's your customer, your member, whoever you serve, that ultimately you are there to do what is in their best interest. And that's how you drive success. And if you think about it, what are some factors that are driving consumer behavior? You do not have to be that young generation Z you don't have to be someone who's an expert in technology. It's people across different age demographics and different walks of life as far as what they do. These are regular consumers that are being influenced by five key factors. It's the mobile device. It's digital payments. It's how they transact and how quickly they transact. It's about biometrics. It's about a cognitive cloud that understands what they need. And it is about big data, which is deciphering and trying to understand intent. Let us take a look at each one of these in a little more detail. We are headed towards a mobile first, perhaps a mobile only environment. That phone you carry is smart, it is enabled, it knows where you are, it knows how to go from point A to point B. We use it for so many things. We use it for retail, for transactions. We use it for entertainment, to watch, view, understand. We use it as a calculator, we use it as a mail instrument, we use it for social media, and we also use it as a traditional telephone. The key here is that with the consumer having that in their hand, they're expecting a lot from us. AI gives us the ability to make it focused, small, and deliver in that environment. The second key aspect is around digital payments. You see, digital payments make things faster. And because it is quick and it touches fewer people, it is cheaper, it is ubiquitous. And the key to keep in mind is that because the consumer begins to touch and trust their mobile device for transactions, they expect the same type of convenience from traditional transactions. Think of this. Elderly people, my parents, who never used Venmo, are today convinced that that is a much better way to transact, send money to grandchildren, 
pay for uh, items at stores, even make major payments on that device because it is easy. And ultimately, money talks. This is what is going to drive a lot of improvement. Biometrics are not creepy. Biometrics make it safer and personalized, more personalized, in fact. We're moving from the era of the four-digit PIN, from passwords, from secure questions, to retinal scans, facial recognition, thumbprint, voice recognition, even gait recognition, how you walk. AI devices through biometrics are picking you up, understanding who you are, and trying to do their best to serve you effectively. Keep one thing in mind. If you know who the consumer is and you are sure, you can do two very important things. Number one, save time by not asking them to identify themselves. And number two, try to serve them through recognition. So you acknowledge who they are to do a lot more. This is what makes uh, someone want to share their biometric information with you without it appearing to be creepy. We're also headed to the world of the cognitive cloud. Personalized relevance, and think about this. There is no shortage of information out there. I'll use a different example to draw some insight into this. Think about Netflix. Netflix is a streaming vehicle that allows you to watch personalized content. There is no shortage of content. In fact, there is an overabundance of content, lots and lots of content. But what does Netflix do? They watch what your interests are. They ask you what you're interested in. They leverage all of that information to try to create a finite set of possibilities for you. That is precisely what we need to think about. Rather than throwing everything at your consumer, think about finesse, coming up with specifics so you can do more and serve them effectively. The next big thing is big data. It's what people tell you stated, it's what you observe them do, and it's what is implied. There is no shortage of data. There is all kinds of data from all kinds of channel, people channel, traditional channels, digital channels, and they come to us from the kiosk, from the branch, from the contact center, whether we are online, mobile, direct mail, email, all of this comes together. And what we have to do is we have to decipher this data to not only personalize how we serve the consumer, but through a little bit of artificial intelligence, can we anticipate that next transaction? What I mean here by implied big data is people who did this also did this, which typically comes down to if you've got a bill coming up, you need to reach out and alert your consumer, remind them that they've got a payment coming up. But what is even better is that if you see they have a bill coming up for say $100, and in their checking account, you only see $82, that's where you use predictive intelligence to go out and talk to them and ask them if they need help meeting that delta, that obligation. Most of the big data solutions that exist today focus on two things. They focus on data collection and number two, on data visualization, which is basic. Very few people work on what is called predictive analytics, which is leveraging the information you have to do so much more. What I've done so far is I've set the foundation of who the consumer is. It's the consumer, what drives the consumer, 
We talked about five key factors. We talked about mobility. We talked about digital payments. We talked about the cognitive cloud. We talked about big data. And uh, we talked about biometrics, which is where we can do more, identify that consumer, and accelerate the way we serve them. Ultimately, what we are headed towards is we want to serve the consumer at any time, anywhere, with complete relevance. And whether a brand is big or small, the consumer will expect that level of service from the brand that is serving them. Everyday consumer experiences are being shaped by a lot of change that is taking place. I talked about Netflix. Airlines have transformed their models from where you checked in with a human to where you checked in at a machine to now where you check in on your own device. Your smartphone makes sure that you will never be a stranger who is lost in a foreign country because you know how to go from point A to point B, and you also can understand language, currency, a lot of that. Self-driving cars, robots that make pizza, robots that flip burgers, robots that deliver food to you. It's the in-home assistance. It's apps that help you get ready. It's drones that can take you or deliver services from one point to another. It's simple devices that everyday consumers use. This is what's driving change. And if you look at Amazon, you get a very good example of a brand that is relentlessly trying to keep innovating because they realize that if you don't, it's going to be left very far behind. And on the other hand, think also about the Apple Watch and perhaps other coming watches. These watches are actually monitoring your health, your personal information, you're feeding it up to the cloud and someone in the cloud is now serving you back effectively. The consumer doesn't care about that privacy as long as you can ensure assure that consumer that they will be safe. And number two, very importantly, that you use this information effectively to serve them better. You're beginning to see AI being encapsulated in how people can be served and that consumer is beginning to expect it. When we talk about AI, I want to set the stage of AI front end versus AI back end. A lot of people who dabble in AI today, what they have typically done is they set up an AI chatbot that simply answers questions, questions that are trivial like, hey, listen, can you help me reset my password? Or can you tell me what my last five transactions were? Or perhaps, hey, what's my balance? When is something due? Yes, this is a good start but it is not enough. There are many brands today, major financial institutions that are deploying chatbots to serve the consumer. There is front-end AI and back-end AI. And I had the opportunity to interview, if I may use that word, where I set up accounts with multiple companies that provide AI-based services these are many different financial institutions. And what I started doing was analyzing and coming up with transactions that I can put forth in front of each one of these chatbots, comparing them. And then I dug deeper into the backend technologies that are supporting it. And I'm gonna share some of that with you. But as I started off, I want to share one simple conversation that I had with Chris. I started it off by greeting Chris saying, how are you? Chris replied, I'm wonderful as always, thanks for asking. I said, can you help me? Chris said, of course, that's why I'm here. 
I asked Chris, are you good? Yes, we offer you the absolute best. Do you have credit cards? Yes, we have three types of credit of cards. Do you want incentives, a lower interest rate, or are you looking for a starter card? How much time will it take? Our application is easy to fill out. 10 minutes and we can even issue it digitally. May I help you fill it out? You are smart, I said to Chris. Chris replied, thank you, I am here to serve you. I continued to admire Chris and said, I think I'm in love. Chris replied, love is a great feeling. I got more specific and said, I think I'm in love with you, to which Chris very nicely responded, don't you think it's too soon for that? All the way from the grammar to the options to even the emojis, Chris here engaged me in a conversation. Chris spoke to me about options. Chris was contextual. When I asked Chris a question about credit cards, Chris just didn't say, yes, we have credit cards. Chris described the three types of credit cards they had. Then Chris even tried to close the sale by asking me if I could help there if it, Chris could help me out. Ultimately, when you think about your chatbot strategy, you need to think about all of these things. And I'm going to tell you a little more about Chris, because as you think about your brand, think about your chatbot needing to have these qualities. First, let's take a look at what makes Chris so special. Number one, Chris responds to voice and text. The AI engine that supports Chris leverages open APIs to convert voice into text. Chris is a natural conversationalist and Chris continues to get smarter and smarter as it learns more each day. Chris understands natural language. There is a natural language processor within Chris that understands colloquialism and context to determine the best way to answer the query. It's based on what just happened, on where you are, the use of language, the use of words. Chris understands all of that. Chris is also being trained to decipher intent. You see, Chris leverages tone, context, geolocation, and other factors to understand what the consumer desires. Chris is also trained to understand frustration and can quickly turn the consumer over to a human if required. Chris understands when you're getting aggravated, you might get upset, you, your voice might go on uh, louder and louder. Chris will transfer you over to a human in order to get provide you with assistance. And even though Chris is so smart already, Chris continues to learn. Chris can correctly respond to 70% plus queries with more than 97% accuracy. All the other queries are turned over to a human or to a number of humans. The gap in learning, that 3% and the 30% of those queries, continues to be addressed by the financial institution through a process called supervised learning. And supervised learning is something you want to do to train machines to answer questions correctly. Microsoft Corporation, a few years ago, launched a Twitter-based chatbot that they let learn openly. So when people wished it good morning, it started wishing people back good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It was all great. But the same people that taught them good words also taught the chatbot bad words and the chatbot started learning that. Chatbots are no different than a child where you can teach behavior. And that is why when you 
train a chatbot, you need to make sure that you use the process of supervised learning to do more. Chris doesn't just answer simple answers. You saw, I asked a question about credit cards. Chris gave me multiple options, but here's another one. I asked Chris to tell me how many times my monthly electricity bill exceeded $140 over the past 12 months. Next, I wanted to know the total amount spent on electricity over the last 12 months and how much I had spent in April of 2019 compared to April of 2018. And I didn't stop there because I also asked Chris when my current bill was due. It took Chris less than a couple of seconds to reply and respond to my query. And I was even asked if I wanted to pay my current bill at that time. Talk about efficiency, talk about listening. That is the type of complexity you want to train your chatbot to be able to respond to. Chris is reliable and Chris is patient as well. I ended up wanting to learn more about Chris. So I spoke to one of the architects that worked on the software project that Chris was created out of. And basically I learned that Chris can scale to answering up to 100,000 concurrent questions. And it takes Chris 250 milliseconds to decipher the question versus 30 milliseconds for another chatbot. Yet the difference in accuracy is dramatic. Chris comes in at 97% plus, whereas the other chatbot is at a mere 33%. This makes Chris a very popular employee within the organization. It makes Chris someone who can answer questions, not just of the consumer who comes to this financial institution, but also of people who work there. And something to keep in mind when you look at your chatbot strategy, three very important things. Number one, is your chatbot capable of answering complex queries? Number two, what is the degree of accuracy that your chatbot is um, able to provide? And three, is your chatbot continuing to learn? And that is something that is really important. Patience is also extremely important because keep in mind that many times you are talking to someone on the phone or you're dealing with someone in a state of panic. This is the consumer you serve and you need someone to be able to collect the information to use it effectively to answer questions. Chris serves consumers and employees. And think about this, many employees seek an answer from Chris before responding to the consumer. Chris is fast and accurate. Of course, this is why Chris has been queried more than 500,000 times a month by consumers 24 seven. I learned one very important thing about Chris. I have now seen Chris being deployed at an organization that has more than 20 million consumers, at an organization with about 10 million consumers, and at a couple of organizations where they have less than 100,000, and the other one where they have less than 12,000 consumers. And what is really important here is that at these companies, they had employees that were dedicated to answer questions between eight to five. Now they have a chatbot that takes care of the answers 24 seven. What I also learned from two of these organizations was that in one of these places, 
they trained Chris to go through 450,000 pages of rules and regulations to answer questions from a 70% person internal contact center. And what Chris is now doing is that contact center is down to less than 12 people. The other people have been deployed to serve consumers directly. Chris is indeed efficient. You see, Chris is an employee. Chris has an employee number. And if you think about your strategy as you deploy chatbots, you want to make sure that you have a long-term strategy. Chris is not a fad. AI is here. AI is here to assist us to do more. AI-based Chris is an actual employee that other employees look up to. Other employees even teach Chris. Chris is there to assist the employees so the employees can take care of the consumer. I had an opportunity to listen to actual employees that were being assisted by Chris as Chris served consumers. People called in right after they had had an accident and they were asking Chris questions about insurance. Hey, can I visit a doctor without getting approval from you? Can I rent another car? Do I need to purchase insurance on that rental car? What type of coverage do I need? Chris was able to articulate and answer most of these questions for the consumer. And what this did for the human that was serving the consumer was really, really good. Because when the human picked up the phone and called the consumer up, Chris had taken a huge burden off their shoulder and the human being could show empathy, which is what is really important when you think about cognitive collaboration, you want to deliver on that empathy so people don't mind that you have a chatbot that is serving you. In the world of artificial intelligence, if you want to scale, you want to back bank a billion people, you need to have a proper artificial intelligence chatbot strategy in place. And I personally feel that the word, word chatbot does not do justice to what all is possible. A machine, an empathetic, intelligent machine helps eliminate human bias. It provides consistent rules-based advice and it can scale to serve 24 seven, focusing on improved ROI. Look at this you can get people to improve trust with your brand, enhance confidence in how they communicate with you and deliver complete consistency in how that consumer is served. A strategy before you go out and invest in a chatbot or an AI engine is extremely important. And in our world of financial services, there are seven keen areas of focus. And this can, of course, also be applied in other industries. It's about how can I provide better service? Can I quickly recognize that consumer through biometrics and make sure that I treat them well and I answer questions effectively? It's about fraud, making sure that I know who it is, I know where they are, I have identified their transaction type, the information they've put, and data, and AI is being used to circumvent fraud significantly. I want to come up with right time precise offers. Can I serve the consumers what they need, when they need it, at the time and place of choosing? Anytime, anywhere relevance, that's what AI is being used for. It's about the back end too, optimizing risk. Can I come up with a dynamic model to balance between success and failure? Can I lower the, the credit scores so I increase my risk 
But as long as I'm getting the return, can I do that automatically? There's a lot that can be done here by looking at things as a whole and AI is being used to do that. It's about regulatory compliance. It's about taking a look at what all we are doing for consumers. Is it done correctly? A lot of these are manual tasks and it takes time and effort to get to the answer. Well, the key here is a machine can do that efficiently and allow the human to answer other questions to make it effective. It's about research. It's about the employee being asked a dozen questions by the consumer and giving the employee access to someone like Chris, easy access to information so the employee can then come back and serve the consumer effectively. That's important. And of course, if I have a chatbot serving my consumers, it gives my employees more time to listen, connect, and serve. There's a small financial institution with less than 12,000 consumers that deployed an AI chatbot to answer 40 frequently asked questions, including resetting passwords and activating and deactivating credit card purchases, credit and debit card purchases. And what they found in the first 90 days of this pilot test is that this chatbot answered 9,136 questions correctly of the 9,400 questions that were asked. The other questions, the difference was turned over to employees. The important thing here is Chris answered these questions in real time can you calculate how many employees and how much time it would take you to answer that many questions for your consumer? That is the ROI we need to start looking at. We need to think about delivering connected experiences. As financial institutions, we have our different channels. We have the kiosk, we have the ATM, we have online and mobile, we have the branch, we have the contact center. We have digital and traditional channels. You have the ability for a consumer to be identified through biometrics, various forms of biometrics. But keep in mind that that consumer has a mobile device that can be used across all these channels. The key here is, can I make sure that I take all that massive amount of information and I'm able to reduce it down to two, three, four, five lines, buttons, perhaps one or two options on that mobile device, allowing my consumer to interact with these different channels efficiently and effectively. That's where we are headed towards. There are many financial institutions that are delivering on this type of functionality, but we have the option to do so much more for those that we serve. AI is going to be leveraged to do much more, both front end and back end, in terms of delivering on cognitive collaboration. I would appreciate your feedback about today's call. If you have any questions or if you would like one of two things, if you'd like a white paper I've put together beyond 2020 people, process and technology, or if you would like a strategic planning guide, please send me an email and I'll send that over to you. I host monthly learning calls. I actually host three calls a month. I do one the beginning of the month, I keep it focused on a challenge we face. The end of the month, I host a call on consumer engagement, marketing best practices, 
And the third call I do in the middle of the month is around a topic that is hot and important to us. If you'd like to join any of these calls, please do send me an email. And until then, I wish you much success as you plan your own consumer engagement strategies. Thank you for joining.